You are listening to the Examine Life with Bram Levinson. So if you haven't clued into it by now, my intention is to be part of the solution. My intention is to offer pathways and thought patterns that help us move away from tension and move away from chaos and move away from conflict. The conflict that we find with ourselves, the conflict that we find uh, with the world around us, with other people. And ultimately, when I record an episode of a podcast, I am doing so because I think that whatever I have to say, whatever my thoughts are, uh, they're important enough to share. Because trust me, I could just walk around with all of this rattling around in my head and not do anything with it. But I don't think that that's the path for me. I think that I am meant to share all of these things so that, you know, these issues and these episodes and whatever I offer into the world provoke thought and potentially, I don't know, help elevate people's vibrations so they get closer to their higher selves and maybe make little corrections so that, I don't know, they end up living a life that is more steeped in, in, in peace and in contentment and in well-being, ultimately. So I think it's really about a return to that. I think that everything I do is meant to bring people back. Back to a place where it's just good. It's just good. Now, there is a shadow side of doing the work that I do. And the shadow side is that, well, I mean, the work that I do and, and the things I talk about in many instances and episodes are instigating people to dig a little bit and to seek and to act, right? And in a lot of, you know, instances and a lot of examples, I'm asking people to look at their own behavior and look at their own uh, systems, their own private logic, and to question those systems and to question that private logic in order to see if there are false beliefs that are motivating them into the world, if there are um, I don't know, the way, ways that they are in the world that are not helpful, that are actually harming them. And if they can be objective enough to be able to examine those and see them, can they tweak them? Can they change them so that they are not being motivated by these harmful patterns of thought, which ultimately motivate us into harmful uh, patterns of action and behavior? So there's work, right? There's work to do. Now, the shadow side of having work to do is that it may unconsciously lead one to believe that what they are, how they are, the way things are, is not okay in itself. That we're not okay until we do that work. That we are somehow inferior or less than unless we are making these corrections and, you know, doing this this thought work and this soul work and and checking ourselves and you know, really just trying to be on this path of self-improvement and self-realization and self-expression. I understand that that is the shadow side of doing this kind of work, of, 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 of helping people understand that there are ways that we can get closer and closer to our ideal selves. Because, you know, that basically gives people the, the unspoken assumption or it gives them the right to assume that if we're not at that place that we think we need to be at then there must be something wrong we must somehow be lacking while i firmly believe in the work that i do and i firmly believe in all of the uh, self-improvement uh, tools and and systems that we can implement i also understand that everything is perfect the way it is i also understand that Ultimately, all we really have is this. All we have is this moment. And if we don't find perfection in this moment, if we're constantly looking for the next best thing or constantly looking for how things could be better or how things could be different, then that means that there's no gratitude for how things are. So I would like to challenge the thinking that, you know, the two are mutually exclusive, that one of that, that if you are seeking then that means that what you already have can't be good enough. I'd like to say that these, those, two, those two states of mind or states of being actually coexist, that you can be in the presence 
of the desire to do better and to uh, learn and to apply what you've learned and to just amass tons of wisdom, but you can also understand that everything is perfect the way it is, that even if you don't amass that wisdom, understanding that everything is perfect the way it is, is wisdom unto itself. When you think about it, this moment is all we have. What I said two minutes ago means nothing. What I'm going to say in two minutes means nothing. What you did yesterday, what you're going to do tomorrow... That shit doesn't exist, except in the stories that go around in our minds. What's done is done. It is done. It's over. Let go of it. The things that are coming, you may be apprehensive about, you may be hopeful about, but ultimately, those exist, again, in your mind. They don't exist outside of your mind. They are not real. And ultimately, all of it, what has happened, what is happening, what will happen, it carries the meaning that you assign it. It is only important if you make it important. And that's up to you. That's not up to whether someone else tells you that it's important. That's up to you. You have that power to assign meaning to whatever, all of it. And so what is the meaning that you give to this, to this moment? Now, I'm asking this question because we live in a moment in time where there is there are just so many polarities and there is so much conflict and there are so many things to object to. And when I do my work in the world, my work of, you know, deprogramming initial response and and questioning the thoughts that come up in my mind or the reactions that come up in my mind and the sensations associated to them that come up in my body, um when I I find myself really objecting to what I deem the the hypocrisy of the world we live in, the unfairness of the world we live in. You know, a couple of years ago in 2016, Gloria Steinem gave an, uh, an interview to Charlie Rose. Gloria Steinem, if you don't know who Gloria Steinem is, do your homework. Gloria Steinem, Gloria Steinem rather, is the mother of feminine, uh, feminine, feminism. She is the mother of the women's rights movement. Uh, she is, God, she, she, she is everything. You need to research her. You need to see her speak. You need to uh, read her books. She is unbelievably wise and un- she gets it. She's got such an, a, a clear perspective on things, or at least I think it's a clear perspective. So she was giving an interview to Charlie Rose in 2016, and Charlie Rose asked her, he said, if you had to make one last speech, and the subject was, look how far we've come, and look how far we have to go, what would you say? And Gloria Steinem replied, I would say, we know we're not crazy, we know the system is crazy. So that answer alone encapsulates everything that I find myself in objection to. There's so many things that I find are worthy of indignation. I think that when girls are being raised to obsess more over the thigh gap instead of the wage gap, we know that we collectively have fallen into times of darkness, blindness, delusion, and distraction. We have lost our way. I think that when bullies and fame seekers and those who act sensationally just to get attention get elevated by our culture to like celebrity status, while those who seek resolution, those who are seeking peace, those who are working for freedom and health for all are relegated to the realm of the tree hugger and the crunchy granola, we know that the system is fucked up. When political systems are set up so that social programs and health and educational resources have to be defunded in order for the, quote, economy to be healthy, we know that the system is indeed broken. Okay, I don't, I don't understand why politics are set up so that if, if the economy is healthy, then all of a sudden, you know, health programs, social programs, educational resources, education, schools are defunded. I don't understand why those two things are inversely proportional. It does it, that doesn't make sense to me. And actually while we're on the topic, let's talk about the economy or rather let me talk about the economy. And I but trust me, when I say the economy, you can't see me, but I am gesticulating so fucking madly. I'm making air quotes all around that word economy. Because 
what is the economy? The economy is a couple of, listen, in, in my understanding of it, it's a couple of people, I'd like to say white men, but I don't know that for sure. So I'll detract or retract that sentence, that, that statement. Um, it's a bunch of people sitting in a room somewhere going, okay, here, the economy's bad now. And all of a sudden that shit trickles down. It's announced. It trickles down into, you know, into the general populations, into the world. And everybody starts to freak out and to react to it. And all kinds of things in our market start to react to it. And everything becomes unstable and everybody f just panics. And, you know, some people kill themselves and other people. It's, it's the, this importance that we give to an entity that is intangible. The economy does not exist. It is a concept that has been like, projected onto us by a bunch of people who believe that they have control and then exercise that control and that you know that the idea of them having control gets reinforced when everybody reacts like little ants i f i completely reject the concept of an economy i obviously pay my taxes i do everything i have to do i, I play the game but trust me you know i told a financial advisor years ago when i was putting money into my rsp uh, my my retirement savings fund, whatever the hell it is. Um, I remember sitting down with my advisor and just saying, you know, I'm putting this money in, but I want you to know that I don't expect to ever see it. And he was shocked. He was like, what do you mean you don't expect to ever see it? And I said, I'm not counting on it to be there when I need it. And he said, why? And I said, because its existence is contingent on the economy. And I don't believe that the economy is something I can depend on because it's run by people who are looking after their own interests, not my interest. Anyway, my advisor was so shocked. I really like f sort of freaked out. And I think that we agreed to disagree in that moment. And I said, look, the only reason I put money in that fund is because it's a tax break at the end of the year. That's it. I don't expect to ever see it. I don't trust. I don't trust all of that stuff because number one, I'm not right in front of it in order to fully understand the way it works. And maybe that's on me. Maybe I should be doing more of my own homework. Um, but ultimately, I just don't trust. I don't trust that something that is presented to me as being there for me is actually for me. Because I, I pretty much have a pretty clear assumption as to who's organizing it and why they're organizing it. It has nothing to do with being benevolent or, or the financial well-being of other people. I don't. So... You know, the system reminds us that it's broken when we see that, you know, these people who run countries and influence the, again, quote unquote economy, which then serves as the catalyst to send everyone into a frenzy when these people decide it's time to fuck with everyone and decide that the health of the economy is in jeopardy. You know, I think that that's an indication that the system is broken. You know, we are so at the mercy of someone else pulling the strings, the puppet strings. It's the Wizard of Oz. We live in the Wizard of Oz. I think that the system is broken when I make a comment while teaching, and this happened at a conference, that if you're not a rich white man, you're going to have to fight to exist and take your place in the world and to be respected and, and to be sort of left alone to do your thing. And then to have a woman of color come up to me and tell me that as a yoga teacher, I'm not supposed to have any judgment and how dare I say that, I think that's an indication that the system is broken. Let me make something crystal clear if it's not clear enough. I may teach yoga and I may teach meditation. That does not put me on a different pedestal than anyone else. It doesn't mean that I figured shit out. It doesn't mean that I am supposed to show up in the world and not display any or all of the human qualities that any of you or anyone else is supposed to display. I am figuring my way out through this path and I believe that that figuring out is meant to be shared. But for someone to come up to me and tell me that to make a comment that if you're not a rich white man, you're going to have to fight in the world is an unfair comment, especially coming from a woman and especially coming from a woman of color. I found that completely shocking, completely shocking. And obviously that existed for me to, to learn from and to understand. And listen, I learned to be more responsible with my words, especially in a venue where I've got four or 500 people listening to me. But it also showed me that people are buying into whatever um, their private logic is. They are sticking to their private logic, even when it holds them hostage on a global scale, on a cultural scale, on a societal scale. 
you know, I made that comment that was before the Me Too movement. And then all of a sudden, rich white men also had something to fear. So, you know, maybe the system just evens itself out. Who knows? Um, you know, I think the system reminds us that it's broken when we human beings fight against each other over money, over perceived differences like skin color or the God one prays to or the language one speaks, who and how one chooses to love one another or another, uh, the gender that one identifies with, the gender one is born into, you know, when we fight over land and territory disputes and, and all the other trivialities. And I, I say trivialities because I see them through a spiritual lens. When we fight each other, instead of understanding that we are all in this experience of being human together, that we are meant to accompany each other and that our differences don't exist to fragment us and tear us apart, but they exist rather to teach each each other about so that we can better understand what it's like to walk in each other's shoes through this experience of life. That's when the system reminds us that it's broken. The system reminds us that it's broken when we are constantly encouraged to believe that success is measured by how much shit you have before the body drops dead instead of measuring success on how much wisdom you can glean and apply to how you live before the body drops dead false idols. We are encouraged to worship false idols. The system reminds us just how badly it needs to be dismantled when we object to someone using the word fuck, but we sit back and allow women to get, pay to get paid rather less than men. We do nothing when the rights of women to do what they want to do with their own bodies that they find themselves in are jeopardized or legislated against. When we don't hold politicians to task when they lie to us about how they're going to represent us if elected and then seemingly have selective memory about what th those platforms were once they are elected. And ultimately, when people are being harmed and killed for expressing themselves authentically in the world for being who they are. All of that exists, and yet we have a problem using words like fuck that might offend our 1950s sensibilities. We need to get over this shit, and we need to get over it now. We need to start waking up and stop feeding stupid, inane, archaic rules and systems that needed to be dismantled decades ago so that we can actually have an honest and authentic conversation with each other, so that we can start to express all of this to each other. Now, listen, you can hear that I feel passionate about this stuff, and I feel like this is stuff that needs to be said because I don't hear anybody else saying this stuff. No one. Everybody just goes, in my awareness anyway, everybody just goes away, goes around rather, acting like none of this is happening or acting like it is happening, but what are we going to do? What are you going to do? Well, for starters, let's talk about it. For starters, let's start being honest about it. Let's start like calling shit by its name instead of calling it by something else and pretending it doesn't exist. While I am bringing all of this to, you know, your plate, today to your table, I want to sort of jump back to what I said earlier in this episode. There are tons of things to be in indignation against, to object to, to rail against. But we also have to remember that everything is perfect the way it is. Now, I know this sounds like a massive contradiction. I refer back to the book Dying to Be Me, written by Anita Morjani. This is a woman who had a near-death experience, and in that near-death experience, she had an exchange with whatever you want to call it, source energy, consciousness, God, whatever. And in that experience, amongst other things that were revealed to her, it was revealed to her that everything is unfolding in the world exactly the way it is meant to, which means that everything is perfect. In all of the imperfection that I just presented to you, in all of the ways to refer back to Gloria Steinem that the system is broken, everything is perfect. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't do something or say something or act in the world when we see a wrong that needs to be righted. But it means that we do it in the understanding that perhaps this has arisen within our awareness so that we can show up in the world and fight our own battle, right? So that women get paid the same. I can't believe we're still having this conversation. It's so stupid. But so that women get paid the same, so that women have the right to do whatever they want with their bodies. Imagine if men were told that they didn't have the right to do whatever they wanted with their bodies. I mean, listen, if you want to play that game, imagine if men had to have children. 
I'm telling you, this shit would come to a screeching halt. The world would stop spinning. Men can hardly even have, and I'm speaking as a man, so I'm speaking like on behalf of, you know, my tribe. Um, men can't even have a cold without that shit being on the news. Do you know what I mean? Like men can't even have the sniffles without, you know, the term man cold, that shit exists for a reason. So imagine if men had to have children, forget it. Civilization, grinding halt. The earth would stop spinning. So listen, all I'm saying is, let me, you know, digress. There are so many things that we can be in objection to. And if we find ourselves in objection to it, then that means that spiritually that's where our work is. But because those things exist doesn't mean that things aren't perfect the way they are. It doesn't mean that if we don't accomplish those things or if we don't see those things change in our lifetime that there's something wrong. It just means that this is. It means that there is imperfection. It means that not everything is always going to make sense to the human brain on a human scale. And that's okay. So we can find ourselves in objection to something without it destroying our peace or robbing us of our well-being. The priority is resolution. The priority is well-being. And I think that if there is a meaning of life, it is to find that well-being in the presence of all the shit that we object to. The meaning of life is to be as close to the vibration of love and good and peace and well-being as possible, especially in the presence of a system that is broken. I want you to think about all this. I want, And please feel free to reach out through whatever channels you want to. Um, and let me know what your take on this is. I'm sure I've said shit here that might offend someone. Listen, apparently it's part of this expression. Um, I apologize, sort of. But more importantly, I hope that I've made you think. Because I think that the things that I've spoken about, we need to think about. We need to challenge how we think about certain things, especially these like hot topic issues. Um, and more importantly, what we do with what we think, how we act, how we share our opinion, whether we stick to our rigid belief systems or if we understand that we are changeable, our beliefs are changeable and we can change our mind. That's okay. If you are able and listening to these words and hearing me, then understand that you are still learning. Just because you've gotten to a certain age doesn't mean that you've stopped learning. If you are vertical, you fuck it, even if you're horizontal, but you are able and you can hear these words, that means that you are still changeable. It means that you have not stopped learning. So hopefully there was something in here that made you think and that maybe instigated some learning. Let me know. Think about it. And I'll see you later. This has been the Examine Life with Bram Levinson.